Support for the Dice Tower comes from listeners like you and from the Op, also known as USAopoly. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, episode 681. One hit wonders. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Jeff analyzes a Nobel-winning auction structure, and we answer questions from the mailbag about the development of the board game industry, which pandemic legacy to play first, and how to be more grumpy in our review segments. Then we finish off the show by highlighting our top 10 one-hit wonders in the world of board gaming. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the take on me to my tub thumping, Tom Vassell. I get knocked down. No, I get knocked down. I'm sorry. I knock Eric down. And I get up again. But he gets it up again. So I keep punching him. Wait. uh, That's not how that goes. I like both those songs. (laughs) Well, that's why they're one-hit wonders. Yeah. I saw that online there was a debate on what exactly a one-hit wonder was. And... Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the episode. Sure. But I certainly understand, you know, people having that debate, right? There's just a lot of stuff, a lot of different things going on in that regard. Mm-hmm. Folks, welcome to the Dice Tower. I'm Tom Vassell. Hi there. I'm Eric Summerer. I think I'm losing my voice. Oh, golly. That usually happens when you're at a physical convention. I know. We're recording this in the very middle of our digital essence spiel. And folks, if you missed that, you, you didn't miss it because it's it's still there. <laughs> we recorded quite a few games online, including the new Bees Ooh. and the new, what did I just play? We just played a whole bunch of stuff today. I don't know. Go look at all of it. There's a lot of cool new games. Uh, Furnace and um, I'm going to be talking about that one in just a bit. Mm. So a lot of cool new games. So I'm excited about all of that. Uh, and we'll be talking about those. I actually, I got a question from somebody, and this is not in the question section, and they just wanted to know why we didn't review pretty much everything here on the podcast. Okay. We just don't have room. <laughs> oh, you mean why Why don't we re- review everything that you are reviewing in video form on the podcast? That's mostly because between each podcast that we do... I play around 24 to 25 games. <laughs> so I can't put that many per podcast. Yeah. Well, I could. It would just be, you know, rotto length at that point. Well, Very long. Occasionally you and, try. You you try and do the, you know, 20 games in 20 minutes sort of thing. Uh, just to catch Sure. And we, and we could do that, I suppose. So then we just pick them. And I, you know, I don't always, they mentioned I don't always do the big games. That's true because sometimes I like to talk about the little ones. Hmm. I like to do a mix between them. Yeah. So, huh. Well, either way, let's get into talking about some of these. But before we do, I should mention we have a newsletter. We'd love you to join the newsletter. Uh, We send it out each or every two weeks. And it just tells you what's going on, DicetowerDigest.com. You can go there to sign up for it. Uh, Just a way to keep track of what's going on with the Dice Tower. And as soon as we have news about any of our events or anything coming on, that's what we do first. Um, Also, we have Dice Tower Now. If you don't subscribe to that podcast, highly recommend it. Dice Tower Now is news and more. In a recent episode, Corey explained the job of a rulebook editor Mm -hmm. talking to different people who make games and rule book editors to kind of, you know, what's that like? Because it's certainly the people we curse the most. (laughs) Well, I just say mean things. Eric curses them out. In private, yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's like if you're a rule book writer, you must be like, huh, I wonder what people have said about me. (laughs) Well, I'm actually very curious to hear about Eric's games, so I'm going to let him go first because 
Well, I just want to hear about these. Sure. Uh, well, I've, it is it is still October. Uh, I have a couple of spooky games to to kick things off. The first is from Funko Games. It's called The Haunted Mansion, or I guess Disney's The Haunted Mansion, Call of the Spirits. Uh, it is a set collection game based on the, the iconic ride from the Disney parks, uh, The Haunted Mansion. And uh, the... the production of this is pretty solid. Uh, the theming is is top-notch. Like, the lid has the stretching room, if you've ever been on this ride where the room gets taller as you're standing there. It's got illustrations inside the box lid. Uh, the, the board is representative of different sections of the ride. You've got the ballroom and the crypt and... Um, You've got the hitchhiking ghosts that are a pawn that moves around here. The object of the game is to acquire ghost cards, to socialize with various uh, haunted denizens of the Haunted Mansion world. And it's got a lot of the, the tropes of, of set collection games, where there's one particular suit that if you have one of them, it's worth one point, And if you have two of them, it's worth three points. And then if you have three of them, it's worth more and more and more if you get more of those. Or there's others that are worth points if you get pairs of them. There are others that are going to give you bonuses for having specific sets of these, uh, getting three of a kind of a type, that, that sort of thing. All of these different suits of ghosts that give you points. You acquire these by moving around the endless hallway. This is um, a circular track uh, in the center of the board that accesses all of these different rooms. There's six, six different rooms. Uh, At the beginning of a round, you're going to draw new ghosts that go in these rooms. uh, And you're also going to move the hitchhiking ghosts around the table. If the hitchhiking Mm. ghosts pass you, they're going to give you haunting cards, uh, these Ooh. are bad. You don't want haunting cards. It's uh, from a deck. They're cards that are just numbered one through three. Uh, and if you have the most haunting at the end of the game, you're going to lose your largest set of cards. That's not good. That's probably the end of the game for you. It's not an outright loss, but it is really nasty if, if it happens. So a lot of the game revolves around getting and getting rid of these haunting cards. So you've added more of these uh, ghosts to the board. You can move around. You can, like, rotate the endless hallway so that not only do you move around the board, but your opponents have also changed position. Um, You can move to the center and get rid of some of those haunting cards. You can draft the, uh, the, the cards, the ghost cards that are on the table. It costs more to take cards from the room that the hitchhiking ghosts are in. Um, And you get three actions, moving around and twisting and spinning and acquiring more ghosts. And then it's the next player's turn. After everybody takes a turn, it's a new round, new start player, and more ghosts come out. Uh, You do this with uh, like an event deck. Um, Each round, you pull one of these. It gives some sort of special rule. You can or can't move around in certain ways. You get bonuses for being with other players, stuff like that. Some special rule for the round. Once, Sounds a little mass markety, that rule. Uh, maybe a little. I don't know. It's not that. It's not that mass markety. Uh, once you get through this deck of event cards, that's the end of the game. Um, And then you total up the points. You see who has the most haunting. You take away a bunch of their ghosts uh, and then uh, count up how many points you've got. It's pretty straightforward. And I guess in that sense, I think it is designed to appeal to a a mass audience, someone who would buy this maybe as a gift, who is a fan of the Disney parks or a fan of this ride in particular. Um, And I think it works. It is it is not obtuse. The the rules are straightforward. Um, I'm a little miffed at the at the way this game is laid out. You have this not small, but not a gigantic board with these six zones. And as you add full-size cards to these zones, they fill up very quickly. And if nobody takes those ghosts for a round or two, suddenly you've got five, six, eight, twelve cards in some of these zones. In fact, there's a an event card that draws more cards into one zone. So at one point, we had like 14, 15 cards in one quadrant or six, sixth, one-sixth of the board. And there was nowhere to put them. And you really need to be able to see what is there because you have to know what you're drafting. You can choose any of the cards when you decide to take one from a zone. And it just got really, really crowded. Um, Then the haunting cards are tiny. These are smaller than Hobbit cards. Tiny little, like, chiclet cards um, that you're drawing and and having to, to keep a little hand of and get rid of. And when you discard, you have to put them on the bottom of this deck, which is a giant, it's like a, a three-inch tall deck 
that you're then putting cards on the bottom of on these this wobbly. It was just a little fiddly. Um, my kids ultimately were not interested. Uh, while it was a straightforward set collection game, it just didn't grab them. They were. Did they play? I mean, did, have they been on the ride? The older one has the 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 younger one freaked out um, after the stretching room, and we had to go out the exit. And I stood outside and waited for the rest of my family to ride it. Well, I'm just wondering if that affected them at all to their liking the game. Maybe. Uh, while the theming is strong, I don't I don't feel like it connects to riding the ride very strongly. It's it's like vignettes from the ride. If you if you love everything about the haunted mansion, you'll like seeing the different ghosts and the iconography and all that stuff. But does it feel like the plot of riding the ride? Eh, not really. So I don't know if that connection's really there. Hmm. This one, all this right. was a miss for my family. My kids really didn't like it, and so therefore I wasn't terribly grabbed by it. And so it's probably going to leave. Uh, I might try it out with uh, the extended family, but it's probably going to go. That's uh, The Haunted Mansion, Call of the Spirits. All right. Well, I'm going to talk about three games at the same time. Oh, golly. Okay. It will come back to you. So this is Boomerang Europe, Boomerang Americas, and Boomerang Australia, all designed by Scott Alms, hmm. and they're all a re-implementation of boomerang yeah all right so boomerang australia all these designed by scott alms all of them published in a conjunction between grail games and matigo hmm. so boomerang is an interesting flip and write game it's actually one of my favorites in the genre i believe i actually played this with eric uh did you i don't think i've had i played this with you we've talked about maybe it. you weren't maybe you weren't there we played it at pax hmm Maybe you were just sleeping that night. It could have been. When we... So in this game, you draft a bunch of cards, and you're going to... I, I say flip and write. It's actually a draft and write, because you'll draft a card each round, and you'll keep drafting them until you have a bunch of cards in front of you. Each card has multiple things on it. It has uh, a number that you're trying to have w the first card you play be lower than the last card you play. It has different sections of the country that you're working in, whether it's Australia, United States, or different countries of Europe. Uh, it has different symbols that you're trying to get groups of. It's, it's unique because you want to score in many different ways, and every card gives you different ways to score. So it's kind of fascinating when you get these cards, you look and say, oh, I want to get two of this. I want to get three of that. I want to get... I want to get this location because I haven't been there yet, and I get a point for every different location I've been to, mm -hmm. and such and so on. I like that a lot in this game. I love that tension. The three games, uh, each one has a different theme to it. I suppose you can you can mix them up a little, maybe. Uh, no, I don't think you can. I think there's a promo pack that you can put in each one, but each one has a the slightest, the tiniest difference to it like in the u.s you want to co connect a root of areas from one side of the map to the other and that's slightly different than australia it's not enough it's not different enough i really can't see why anyone would want to own all three okay because they all do pretty much the same thing unless you're just really bored like oh we played australia a million times all right let's go to europe yay i uh, it's just they're very similar in that regard. Hmm. There's also a few goofy things they did. So these boxes are about the size of a 4x6 card. Okay. Uh, that's different in centimeters. Sorry, Europeans. Hmm. It's a pretty good size box. The scoring sheets in it are less than half that size. Oh. That really bugs me. They're really tiny. I don't know why. I could get that they were, they were a little small in the original game, but the original game was the size of a small box of cards. Mm -hmm. This is not, so I don't know why the sheets are so small. I'm going to have to actually color copy them, print them, and grow them, I think, and then, <laughs> of course, laminate them. It just, it's, it, I've had multiple people complain about it mm. because it's really tiny and hard to see. Other than that, they're fine. I did have one complaint about an irritation I had 
in the USA one. I think it's the USA one. Uh, and in the on these cards, there are different animals. And if you get a pair of these animals, you get the points for them. And so the animals that are worth six points are – there's fewer of those in the deck. There's sure. a lot more that are worth three points. So you have to sit there. If you see a six-point animal come by, you can go, well, have I already seen one of these? If I have, will it come by and I can draft it again? You know, if not, I'm taking a chance. You know, it's some interesting things like that. I like that. Well, in the U.S. one, there's a Bigfoot one that's worth nine points. Huh. I, was like, I was like, cool, I'll draft that. Where's the other one? Guess what? There is no other one. There's just one. So I was like, huh. I must have lost a card. Hmm. I counted out all the cards, looked through everything. It seemed correct. Went through the rules with a fine-tooth comb. Didn't mention it. Looked it up online. And lo and behold, the publisher was like, ha ha, Bigfoot's elusive. So that's kind of a joke. Well, ha ha, you just lost a point of my rating off your game. Wait, what? So (laughs) That's, that's annoying. I find that really annoying. If it's a joke... Then make it clear in the rule book right away. Yeah. So so the Bigfoot is in the deck as something you need to find a pair for, but there is no second Bigfoot. There isn't one. Now, there is in this little mini Kickstarter thing, there are six cards that, I, like I said, can be put in any of the sets. One of those, I want to say it's like Bulgaria, has a wild thing on it. Oh, so that would match it. Wow. But I don't want to stick Bulgaria in my USA game. And you shouldn't need to have a Kickstarter promo in order to make the game play. Uh-huh. Yeah, sometimes jokes are funny, and I get it. Again, if the rule book had said it, maybe I would have found it more amusing. I'd just be like, oh, okay, oh, by the way, everyone, Bigfoot's a joke, ha, ha, ha. I still say that now, obviously. I don't know. I just found that to be a little annoying. That's... That's just weird. If I was getting one, I would probably get Europe. Hmm. Because it has an extra rule. Australia is just plain vanilla. USA, I like the rule. I think I like the rule in USA about connecting the coast the best. But that Bigfoot thing irritated me so much. Uh, Hmm. And also, like I said, the sheets are small in all of them. So I found that to be a bummer. Other than that, they look beautiful. The game is great. It's one of my favorite of the roll and write, although you're technically drafting and write, but in that genre, sure. I really like it. So that's the Boomerang series. Hmm. Cool. I liked the original, uh, so uh, seeing a different map would be fun. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Tell me, Eric, I need to know what you think. Okay. Uh, next is another spooky game. This one is an escape room, specifically Escape the Room, the Cursed Dollhouse. This is the latest from the Think Fun series, uh, which included uh, Stargazer's Manor and Dr. Gravely's Retreat, or Gravely's Retreat, uh, that were like family level escape room games um, with some cool physical puzzles. And Think Fun has gone all out. With this edition, this is a larger box because the box itself gets assembled into a dollhouse uh, with four rooms and an attic. And then a you bunch actually of stuff. use the front and the back of the box. Yeah, imagine you, you take the front and the back and put them next to each other, and then you add a floor between them, you add a roof, you add um, a, a, like a backing for the roof with a, a, a clock tower, and... Um, And then you assemble some furniture and you have packets of stuff that gets seated in the different rooms. And then you begin the game and you start in one room and you'll progress through the different rooms and discover items and all sorts of stuff. Um, It is much like the others in the series. It uses a similar system with a a code wheel where you're searching for symbols and and trying to line them up and then seeing if, uh, if symbols appear on the inside of the um, of the disc, and they did something in this edition that they were trying to correct an error, um, or at least a criticism in previous uh, versions of the Escape the Room game, where if you were paying attention as you spun these wheels around, you could sort of tell when you were close to a solution because you could see the symbols show up in the little holes in the center of the disc. So they added this, like, locking system, the, the inner... Uh, disc can open and close. So you can close it, spin the wheels around, and then open it to see if the symbols you're looking for show up. 
doesn't this, work very well. It yeah, it's it's a it's fiddly. <laughs> it, it it things get out of whack a little easier, and you're trying to lock and unlock, and you you sort of look at it and go, "Is this locked?" And then you see something you're not supposed to see. Um, I understand what they were trying. Whatever. To do, I just I just tried not. I just left mine unlocked. Just, I said, "Forget it." Just don't look at it. But. It, Anyway, uh, the the puzzles here have a significant physical aspect to this. This is probably the most ambitious escape game that I've played uh, with pieces of furniture that are taped to the wall and then you get to open and search inside and... Um, and unfold and put together. And there are some destructible components that you then have to print out replacements for. If you're going to reset, it's it's almost resettable. Um, I do plan... <laughs> That's baloney, Eric. This, this game is only resettable... It would take you longer to reset it than to actually play the game. I, I don't. I don't agree with that. It is possible. There is a tutorial on the website, um, but it will require a lot of taping. Um, and this was one of my chief complaints about the game: is that it's so physical and so. Um, so much of the game is pulling things off of the wall or removing components that are like pre-attached to things. And I felt like I was breaking it. I, it was hard for me to figure out when I was still doing it right and applying the right amount of force in pulling something off or manipulating some of these components and not breaking it. Um, several of the puzzles were like that. Several of the removal of things from the walls were like that because they used like this sticky. It wasn't. It wasn't just tape. They used like a sticky um, glue, a rubbery glue dot um, to attach many of the components, which. You're, was, you're not selling your point here about how easy it is to put back together, but all right. Well, I want to find the right tape. Like, there's got to be a proper adhesive that will do this um, better, and, and I, I haven't figured that out yet. I, I do want to run this at a convention um, someday when we have a physical convention to go to again. I think it would be fun. I think you would really benefit from having a game master for this because while there is a hint system – uh, online, which is nice and visual. It's like click the room you're in and then click the thing you're trying to figure out. And, and it, it does lead you in a pretty nice fashion in progressive hints. There were some hints, even with the hints, that I still didn't understand what the solution was supposed to be. Uh, one or two puzzles, I said, D even you telling me how this works, I still don't get how I'm supposed to learn that from the clues you're giving me. Um, and again, I don't want to you know get too specific because I'm going to you know, spoil it. Well, I I I know what you're talking about, dude, because I ran into the same thing. They're like, "This is how you solve it," and I was like, "Cool," but that's like it's equated to like, "Hey, the way to shoot a three point shot is to jump up and arch your back." <laughs> okay, cool, but I still can't do it, yeah. and that's what these feel like. Some of them are like, "Do this," I'm like, "Great," but I still can't do that. Yeah. There, there were some – one of the final puzzles just had me – I knew exactly what I needed to do. But actually getting the components to do what they wanted me to do was way frustrating. Um, so it, it's ambitious. If you're looking for a challenge and something dramatic – to, to throw on the table, um, and it's it's nice and creepy and spooky about these haunted dolls and this haunted uh, you know dollhouse. Yeah, it's it's worth worth an exploration. But is know that it is far more creepy than previous editions. It's far more difficult than previous editions, and some of those clues are <sighs> just a little more frustrating than I would like them to be. So it would be almost better to have someone who knows the game and has worked their way through it to help guide you through than, uh, than necessarily relying on all of the hints. And be able to say, am I supposed to take this off the wall? Yes, you are. Or no, don't pick at that. It's not supposed to be like that. That is Escape the Room, the Cursed Dollhouse. One of the most ambitious... How many people did you play this with? Me. Okay, but see, that's you. that was one of my other complaints about it was I don't think it holds more than two people. You, it requires yeah. extremely high lighting. You have to, like, peer into the house. You have to at many points. Yep. If you're sitting on one side, you're going to see nothing yep. because that's the back of the house. And we found with three people, one person wasn't – we had to keep 
sliding the house around, which was not easy to do. Yeah, and lighting it with flashlights. You have to like turn on your phone light and, and look around. In oh, my there. word. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Which, there, if you're also using your phone for the clues, was annoying. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I had a phone and an iPad for, for the two things. But I, there are pieces of furniture <laughs> that can be removed. So there, there were enough things to look at for multiple people. And certainly some of the puzzles were tricky enough that another brain would have been good. Some of them I really liked. I, I thought they were very clever and, and felt very happy when I did figure them out. But some of them, you know, sometimes these leaps of logic, the designers are saying, oh, yeah, this makes perfect sense. And when you try and break it down, it doesn't, it just didn't work with my head. Anyway. The Cursed Doll. All right. Well, let, let me just do one more game here okay. then since we talked so long about these. Let me talk about Furnace here. So sure. Furnace feels like a throwback to a older time. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Like it feels like this was back when there was these classic games being made in the 1990s or the early 2000s. That's what this feels like. It's designed by Ivan Lashin who – is one of the designers of Smartphone Incorporated and Skytopia. Uh, yeah, those are the main games he's done. And so Furnace, which is from Hobby World, was certainly one I was interested in. It's a very simple game in which you have four rounds, and each round there's two halves. You have a auction half where you'll place out a row of cards in front of everybody, and players take turns placing discs on these cards. You have discs one through four of your color. You can put a disc on a card as long as it's a different color than all the other discs, meaning you can't bid on the same card with more than one disc, and you can't put the same number on the same card. So Eric puts his four on a card. I can put my one, two, or three there. If Eric puts his four there, Mandy put the two there, and Suzanne put the three there, I can put the one there only. Hmm. After everyone does that, whoever put the highest number is going to get the card, but at the top of the card, there's something called compensation. So it might give you coal, um, steel, oil, or let you change coal into steel or steel into oil. It's something like that. And you can do that times the number of your disc that's there, but only if you don't win it. So putting a three somewhere, and it, let's say at the top it gives me two coal, I just got six coal. If Eric put his four there and beat me out, hmm. if Eric doesn't put his four there, then I don't get all that coal, but I do get the card. Okay. So that's, so that it's this really interesting back and forth thing. You, you want to win cards, but you also want to get this compensation. Now, after everyone has won their cards, then players will take turns. Acti- well, you could all do it at the same time. You just activate all your cards, and you could activate them in any order, and the cards do different things. Like a card might say... Get two coal. This card might say turn two coal into a steel. This one might say turn a steel into this. And many of the cards turn stuff into money, which is victory points. There's also these little cogs you can get, and there's a building everybody starts with that lets you upgrade cards, and you can flip them over, and they give you extra things that they can do when you activate them. This is such a smooth, fast, excellent game. It takes less than an hour But it's very involved. It has a lot of interactiveness in that bidding each round. And then it has a time of solitaire, run your machine all at the same time. Hmm. It reminds me a lot, actually, of Res Arcana because you have to figure out this small, little, tight machine with just a few cards. You figure you'll get, like, at most maybe 10 cards over the course of the game. Okay. Uh, And it's... Just really interesting. I mean, yes, you're just literally changing coal, steel, oil, oil, and cogs into each other and into points. But knowing the correct order to activate your cards and then that auction phase, I really, really enjoy this one. Oh, everyone also has a special power, which is cool. All right. Like the game I just played, I played a character who had an extra disc, an extra two disc. And another person has a power that when they get compensation – their disc acts as if it's one higher than it normally is. Hmm. Yeah, so it's a lot of fun. I I really recommend it. It's fr- from Hobby World. I don't know who's picking it up in America yet, but 
it's pretty neat. So I fully expect to see it come to America. Sweet. Well, you have my attention. Yes, I really feel like, you know, there's some games I don't know if Eric would like or not. This is one I think you would like. Cool. That's Furnace. All righty. Well, let's talk about important things. It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. This year's Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded to Stanford professors Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson for their work on one of my favorite topics, auctions. Now, Milgram and Wilson have done a lot of work analyzing the outcomes of different types of auctions. In a series of influential papers in the 1970s, they looked at two classic types, English auctions and Dutch auctions. Now, the English auction is what people classically think of when they picture an auction. People with paddles and an auctioneer increasing the price until no one else will raise. A Dutch auction, by contrast, is when the price is started very high and is gradually reduced until the first person says they'll take the item at that price. Now, they looked at the final bid value versus the value that the bidders collectively assigned to it. In an ideal auction, the final bid is equal to this value. Typically, though, auctions result in the winner paying a higher price than the value, which is called the winner's curse. Now, Milgram and Wilson learned that an English auction leads to a smaller overbid than a Dutch auction, and they were able to trace the reason back to information. The more information that is available to the bidders about what the other bidders are thinking, the better they can fine-tune their bid. Now, in an English auction, as the price is increased and people drop out, the bidders learn something about how others value the item, and they are better able to adjust their own bid. But in a Dutch auction, there is absolutely nothing said by any of the bidders except for the winner. As soon as someone says they'll take the item, that ends it. So the bidders have very little information about the value from other bidders, and once the bid hits their max value, then they might jump in at any time. A Milgram and Wilson continued to work on auctions through the 1980s, introducing different techniques to different industrial auctions, but their big breakthrough came in 1994. The U.S. government, through the FCC, was going to auction off part of the wireless spectrum for cell phones. Now, previously, all over the world, a variety of systems for allocating spectrum had been used, ranging from lotteries to bribes, but none had proved particularly satisfactory. The true value of the limited resource of wireless spectrum was not being realized by governments. And there's a lot of complications in giving out slices of the spectrum. There's a limited amount. You typically assign different blocks at the same event. And values vary based on frequency and bandwidth. So it's complicated to design a system that will accommodate all of this. Now, for the 1994 auction, Milgram and Wilson developed a new method called the Simultaneous Multiple Round Auction, or SMRA, and here's how it works. All the pieces of the spectrum are auctioned off at the same time in a series of rounds. In each round, each bidder secretly submits their price for each piece that they're interested in. All bids for all the pieces are then revealed, although not which bidder made which bid, but everyone is aware of all the bids made. Then the next round is begun. Again, for each piece, bidders simultaneously submit secret pieces for each slice, but their bid must be higher than the highest bid currently on that item. You can also pass, but once you pass on any specific slice of spectrum, even in the first round, you can never bid on it again. The bids are again revealed, and then a new round is started. This continues until no bids are submitted that are higher than the highest bid, and there is no limit to the number of rounds. In designing the SMRA format, Milgram and Wilson were trying to maximize the information that was available to all the bidders and allow the auction to take as long as necessary to permit the participants to properly evaluate their options and determine their bids. And the 1994 event was a great success. Both the government and bidders were very satisfied with the results, and the simultaneous multiple round auction became the standard for wireless auctions going forward. There have been a number of different extensions of the SMRA concept for different situations. 
Some Spectrum auctions use the terrifically named combinatorial clock auction, which is used when certain combinations of Spectrum slices are more valuable if purchased together. Here, bidders can submit bids for packages of specific slices as well as for individuals, and there is a fairly complex clearing step where the combos are evaluated and assigned. A more recent example is the incentive auction, which was recently used by the FCC to reassign TV frequencies to new users. This consisted of two concurrent auctions, a reverse auction where existing Spectrum holders could offer to sell their slices, and a forward auction where those looking to acquire those slices could offer increasingly high bids. As they met in the middle, the transactions were made and the Spectrum slices were reassigned. I'm not sure if the SMRA-style auction could be used in a board game. It seems like having multiple rounds of simultaneous secret bids would just take too long. But I am intrigued by the idea of bidding different amounts for different combinations of items. I could see some very interesting applications of that idea. And congratulations to professors Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson for their well-deserved Nobel win. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. Support for this podcast comes from The Op, bringing you a trio of spooky games for this October, including Friday the 13th, Horror, Ultimate Trivial Pursuit, and Scooby-Doo Chronicles. In Friday the 13th, Horror at Camp Crystal Lake, summertime fun is dying out at Camp Crystal Lake, where masked and murderous Jason Voorhees is on the hunt for Camp Counselor Blood, and your unlucky day is looming. It's for ages 17 and up, and plays in about 60 minutes. Horror Ultimate Trivial Pursuit. There's no turning back from Trivial Pursuit Horror Ultimate Edition. Explore the darkest corners of pop culture in this fact-based challenge where survival skills are a must to answer 1,800 blood-curdling questions from across all horror genres. Also for ages 17 and up, plays in 60 minutes. Scooby-Doo Chronicles. Step into the roles of Scooby-Doo and the Mystery Inc. gang as you work to solve the mystery in Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. It's for players 12 and up and plays in about 12 or more minutes. For more information on all of these spooky selections, visit theop.games. Questions. 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 All right, our first question here is from Lou. Lou says, we often talk about online platforms for board games. And what we do, Lou doesn't say this, but I know we will often say Tabletop Simulator and Tabletopia. Those are the two that we talk about mostly. Okay. He says he doesn't recall us hearing any mention of Board Game Arena. He found it a terrific way to play a range of games, especially in a time where live gaming is at best challenging. My go-tos there are through the ages, Carcassonne and Innovation, Plus, it's free unless you upgrade to give more control over certain games. Mm -hmm. Is there a glitch or problem I don't know about? Some reason not to mention Board Game Arena. He also wanted us to know he wasn't affiliated with the site. He wanted to know why we didn't mention it as much. Okay. So why not, Eric? Uh, I... I haven't played there very much. When when the, the COVID situation started and a lot of folks were looking for, uh, you know, places to play online, I did show up. Um, but this was when Board Game Arena, if I recall, was surprised, let's say, by the number of people suddenly showing up. Because, you know, you run a website and you're used to a certain amount of traffic and all of a sudden that triples – you're not necessarily ready for that. And and they had some very quick growing pains, if I recall. And at some point had to limit um, to only their premium subscribers or only guarantee that their premium subscribers could get in at a particular time. Um, I'm sure that they have – that that's evened out and they've, they've worked out these issues. But at the time when I was trying to log in, that – wasn't uh, working out. So at least currently, that's why I haven't been there and I, I hadn't uh, – had uh, had an opportunity to play anything there before then. So it's just lack of experience on my part in playing on Board Game Arena. Yeah, I uh, so Board Game Arena, folks, one of the benefits of it is it forces you to follow the rules. Mm-hmm. So Tabletop Simulator and Tabletopia, they have the games plugged into them, but for some reason, some of these games you can flip tables and <laughs> slide cards around. I mean, you have to program these Sometimes yourself or the companies do it. It's kind of like actually playing a game. Or if I want to get up and look at Eric's cards, I could. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be 
That's uncouth, but you can do it. Board Game Arena doesn't let you do that. You follow the rules. It does so at the cost of graphics. Okay. It's clearly doesn't look as good as the other websites. I think it's fine. I just don't play online very much at all. I just have mentioned the other ones, but I have no problem with Board Game Arena. All right. Um, so that's, that's another option for people to go to. If I still like iOS the best. Okay. Luke says, I haven't been able to get legacy games to the table yet. Realistically, I don't imagine I'll have time to play three pandemic legacy games. Should I skip straight to season zero if I'm only going to play one of them? Yeah, this is interesting. We've been talking about this a lot. Uh, me and uh, Richard Ham, Rado, were talking about this, and he has the erroneous opinion that you should play them in order zero, one, and two. Oh, but interesting. I much more recommend that you start them from you play one, then zero, then two. Now, if you're only playing one, that's tough. The reason I recommend you play one first is because you literally start at Pandemic. And then it makes minor changes, and it changes more as the game goes by. But even when you get to the very end of the game, it's still pretty close to Pandemic. Yes. Um, the Season Zero, I like better... But it's also more of a gamer's game, and it it you do, you don't run into that that problem of hang on I'm losing track. <laughs> well, season zero is close ish to the uh, original game as well. It 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 still feels like a pandemic, um, at least at the beginning. I've only played the demo. Um, my copy is waiting at my friendly local gaming store uh, as we're recording this as of tomorrow, so I'm hoping to pick that we'll up over the weekend. Um, but I, I have, all I've played is the the basic demo as if they ran it at Gen Con or something. Uh, on And isn't that even different than Pandemic? It It's not that different from Pandemic. It's... Wait, you're talking about Season I'm talking Zero? I'm talking about Season Zero. It, it, you're still going around... It's... The the ta- you know you're going around the the board and uh, and dealing with a single disease at least at the beginning the the agents, um, I don't know. Yeah, but driving the vans around and stuff, it feels very different, and it gets even more different as the game goes okay. by. Two even more so than that. Yes. Um, I like the story in one the best. The story in zero is good. So if you're only going to play one, I really kind of think I would still point you to one. Yeah. Is one still available in, in a you know relatively good quantities? Can you still pick up season one? I don't know. I just saw Risk Legacy at Barnes and Noble. No. I was like, what? You can still get it? Interesting. I wonder if that's a new printing. I I'm sort of terrified to open up my second copy of Risk Legacy. I kept one in shrink for the the kids to play. Um, but I've heard stories about the glue not working properly on, on some of the sticker sheets, and I'm a little worried about opening it up. Then open it up and look at it. I guess I could. I mean, how is that? You're, you're, you're like doing a Schrodinger's Legacy. Schrodinger's Legacy. That's the next one. <laughs> is there something in the box? I don't is know. Is there something in the envelope? Both yes and no. We've actually been talking about this. When we were done with Pandemic Legacy Season 0, Jason was dying to have it. And I literally thought about shrink-wrapping the game that we had done (laughs) and giving it to him because I knew he would just take the game and throw it in his house. (laughs) And I've been threatening to just give him games with bricks inside him. He wouldn't know the difference. He never opens them and plays them. So what does it matter? (laughs) I'm getting off topic. Yeah, where were we? Jason says, <laughs> this is different a different Jason. Jason. Okay. Jason says he considers himself a recovered magic player, goes to board games, and he played Lords of Waterdeep. That was his intro game. But he wants to know, and I'm I'm struggling a little bit to, to parse this question, but he wants to know what stunts board game growth. He says video games were in, invented in the mid-80s, and they've had a huge increase. And there has been much time since the 80s. But board games has been around for a long time. But unlike video games, it doesn't take technology to to develop board games. Just great imagination and ingenuity. 
So what has either boosted board game development in our current short time period, or if that's not the case, what has stunted it before this golden age of board games we're in? So I think what he's saying oh, okay. here is that board games have really been like, have boosted in the last 10, 15 years. It's actually more close. It's closer to 25 years. Um, and what has done that, and especially since board games have been around for such a long time. By the way, let me tell you an interesting story here, Eric. Sure. Abraham Lincoln did not have a beard for the longest time. Okay. Well, no, I'm serious. He, he didn't. Sure. You didn't know that? I, I did know that. Well, there's like this, this like story of this girl who persuaded him to grow a beard. So he did. We, we don't know what made him change the beard, but he changed the beard right before he became president. Hmm. This was to the detriment of a photographer who had been selling photographs of Abraham Lincoln without the beard. <laughs> His, he went broke overnight. Wow. Um, basically, because no one wanted to buy them anymore. So he decided to switch his career and start, um, well, making board games. And thus he did. He started the Milton Bradley Company because that was his name. Okay. And made the game the checkered game of life, which eventually turned into life and did quite well for a while. And, of course, we know how Milton Bradley did. I thought that was interesting. I had not known that until just a month ago. So you're saying that what stunted board game development was not enough photographers becoming board game publishers? No, that's just a side note. That's free, folks. Education. All right, but... I'm, I'm confused. Um, I'm dizzy. No, no, no. I, that just came to my mind because okay. I was thinking about how board gaming started way back in Milton Bradley's day. Sure. And I'm thankful that Abraham Lincoln grew a beard. I already had great respect for Abraham Lincoln as a president, and this makes me like him even more because we can directly credit him with board game growth. So Abraham Lincoln's one of the factors is what I'm saying. Okay. Or facial hair. Because Abraham Lincoln was a neck beard. So you're saying we need more facial hair? No. <laughs> Eric, stop ruining my historical teaching moment I'm here. I'm trying that was a to answer line. Jason's question. Jason, your question's really easy. Internet. Yes. 1995, Settlers of Catan and the Internet and Magic the Gathering. Yeah. The trifecta came out and they blew the industry up. Magic the Gathering made stores viable all across the world. Settlers of Catan brought Euro games from Germany and made them a phenomenon all over the place. And this happened because the Internet made it so. Suddenly, I didn't have to look at a bulletin board for someone else who might want to play these board games. I could go online and easily find people. Mm -hmm. You know, we credit a lot of things with growing a hobby, but there's no question, no question, objectively, the internet is the number one reason the hobby's where it's at today. Sure. And it's not the only one. Eric's Eric's wife does um knitting. Knitting. And that she keeps in touch with the various people through the internet. Yeah. Book clubs have moved to the internet. Train, you know, there's just so much. The internet has really exploded different niche hobbies, which board gaming is. Yep. So that's why there's been such an increase in the last so many years. And and why video games have increased at such a much faster rate with digital distribution of games and inexpensive apps uh, make it so easy to get a new game instantaneously. You don't have to go to the store. Whole bunch of questions from an anonymous letter writer. <laughs> well, he asked us not to use his okay. name. <laughs> so... One suggestion first on clarification on game reviews. Um, on Dice Tower Now, uh, we often mention um, various uh, gaming terms. And this anonymous poster says, I still don't know if a tableau is different than a player board. So perhaps just keep it simple and call it a player board. Well, it, it is different, actually. A tableau is an area in front of you, usually an area of cards. Mm -hmm. uh, this is popularized from the game Race for the Galaxy, where you were slowly putting uh, 12 cards in front of you, and we just called that your tableau. Yeah. I still feel like the term's a bit pretentious, 
but I can't think of a better term. So yeah, I think a tableau that is an arrangement of smaller things, whereas a player board is a large thing that you might put small things on. Example two: I definitely don't know what a rondelle is, and I don't even know how to spell it. So I can't suggest a, another term. A rondelle is a circular action track. Usually, you can move a certain number of spaces around the circle on your turn, uh, an activation.、Um, but each one of those spaces is going to do something.、Um, you know, one of your things, your your options for the turn,、um, and and that's made popular by Matt Gertz Designs. But lots of other games have a rondelle as well. And it's spelled R O N D E L. Yes. Random pet peeves that I know I can't change. I call games with one player single-player games, not Han Solo games. Or okay, I don't, I don't even know how that's even a thing, but okay. <laughs> Or legacy games, which really throw new board gamers for a loop, as legacy doesn't mean play one time through in any other context in common usage that I know of, except that the first game but, to but, do this was Risk Legacy, and that's why. It's yeah, but that's not it, right? There's there's games you can play one time through, but I don't call them all legacy. You play escape room games one time、right. through. Legacy games are called that way because when you're done playing through it, your character has left a legacy behind on the、yep. world physically. It has a persistence. In Risk Legacy, you named the countries for, in one game, and it stayed till the next game. There was a legacy that you left behind、yep. you. It actually has a meaning in that regard. You, you put stickers. You tear up cards. You make permanent changes to the game as you play through. From game to game.、Uh, also, due to my education, I do know that the singular of automata is automation, not automata, which I heard pronounced automata on the show to describe the automation required. That might be me.、Uh, to make a two-player game work in a single-player mode, I think. Yeah. Well, well, you're pro- you're technically right with the singular and plural of of the word. I think this comes from the Automa Factory, which is an organization that makes, commonly makes single-player versions for Stonemaier Games products.、Uh, I think they've done some other publishers as well, but they're a rather famous、uh, designer of single-player variants that have now been included in、uh, various games. And so, knowing that as Automa Factory. People just call the single-player mode an automa instead of an automation or an automaton.、Uh, an idea for a segment idea. One thing that I always look for when deciding if I like a game is figuring out how much player interaction there is. So if you incorporate that info into the reviews, that would be very helpful. For example, is no,、nope, I'm gonna stop you right here.、Okay. I'm just gonna skip ahead on here. Yes, we could make a scale for this. But my goal is in our reviews that when you listen to them, you can kind of figure that out. There's no way to quantify it. Like I just mentioned in earlier in this review, Furnace has player interaction in the auction phase, but doesn't have any afterwards. But that's not a scale of zero to ten. Once you start applying numbers to stuff, it's really problematic. If you don't believe me, go buy a GMT game. They make lots of war games. On the back, they put solitaire suitability. And they have a scale for that. Literally, it should be a yes or no switch. <laughs> like yes, you can play it solitaire or no. Okay. Then they have complexity. I have never seen one that's complexity goes to ten. Well, I've seen ones that have like a complexity of three, and I played it, and it's a filthy lie. <laughs> okay, but for people who are heavier in the war games. It maybe is a three, but to just anyone walking up, that number doesn't mean anything. You gotta be really careful with numbers. The the ten is a theoretical limit. They just they haven't found <laughs> it yet. It's something they keep striving for, and they <laughs> haven't quite reached it. Otherwise, if they called something a ten, then what? The quest is over. So. <laughs> oh, and last thing from anonymous. Also, in my opinion, one player games are more like activities. And not really core to what people think of when trying to define board games, and wouldn't be considered mainstream, I think, like single-player computer games are. You mean like the extremely mainstream game called Solitaire? <laughs> I fe- I fe- you had that ready. I did have that ready.、Yeah. No, look, no, it could be a game still. Come on, don't be rude. <laughs> and besides, there's a huge solo community. There is. It's on Facebook and. 
you can say mad, bad things about solo games. I've learned my lesson. I love solo <laughs> games. They're amazing. It's still board gaming. Drew says he's been thinking about rule interpretations quite a bit. He wants to know our wisdom on the subject. Uh, you've come to the wrong place, Drew. He says, when playing a game that doesn't explicitly explain all potentialities, does your group usually interpret the rules in favor of the players or the game? So I'm assuming he's talking about cooperative games here because he talks about Cthulhu, Death May Die. They came across an ambiguous situation, and I'm the one who always interprets in favor of the game. Okay. I think it depends. I mean, if you're talking about a cooperative game, uh, I think it, it might depend on how things are going at the time. Like, is this already a really difficult game? Um, then I might be more lenient. Um, but it could also be, you know, in a multiplayer game, a non-competitive uh, game, where you have a player that wants to do something, and is this this card combination going to work the way I think it is? That can also be, you know, ruling in the player's favor versus the more stringent interpretation of the rules in the game's favor. Um, I don't know if I lean one way or the other in these circumstances. I think I just try and go for consistency as best as possible. And uh, Well, actually, I know where I lean. I mean, my number one leaning is thematically what makes sense. Sure. Right. But if it's still not sure, 100%. I was just talking to Eric about this before we started recording. I am sick of cooperative games beating the snot out of players <laughs> on quote-unquote easy level. I don't get it. I don't know why people love to just have their butts handed to them on a silver tray all the yeah. time. I want to be able to win a cooperative game once in a while and make it harder if I need to. So if I come with a rule ambiguity, it's going to me. <laughs> not to the game. If we're like, I'm not sure, me. Okay. What should we do? Me. Because I'm also it's when I say me, I mean yes, us. The team. You know. And I am so tired of losing cooperative games. Okay. Well there you go. I'm you know what? I'm I'm interpreting stuff that's not even ambiguous. Like I'm pretty sure no the rules say it right here. Nope. Still us. <laughs> if the game is going poorly, then That's a joke, yeah. folks. That's a joke. No, I'm not I don't do that. Well, I mean, at some point, you know, the, the goal is fun, so if you're really not having fun getting smacked down, then maybe a, a more liberal interpretation of the rules. Wow, Eric Eric brought the whole episode around to the very beginning. Did I? Back to tub thumping again. <laughs> All right, last but not least, uh, a, a letter from Tim who says, I have two friends. They both like movies. When I ask friend one about a popular movie that has gotten great critical reviews, he tells me his honest opinion. Rarely gives in to the popular praise, and yet his opinions are usually spot on. He's not just going against the hype. When I ask friend two about the same movie, or any movie for that matter, his response is always, It's great. I loved it. The Dice Tower is most often friend two. You need a Grinch on your show. A reviewer that doesn't like most games, or at least can find the flaws in them. Perhaps someone that only likes a slim portion of the options available, or is critical of certain mechanics, or represents the non-gamer audience, and is someone who can provide an opposing viewpoint. Anybody who has spent time on the Dice Tower Facebook group knows that the haters are out there. I just want to hear from one of them once in a while, via a well-argued perspective, which is not always present on Facebook. They could review some of the more Him. popular games and provide a Grinch's perspective. You know, kind of like what Tom does to Eric on every top ten list ever. Eric, don't be adding your commentary. That is what he wrote. That is text There's no proof. Come to think of it, Tom is the closest person you have to that right now. So maybe <laughs> this would be a more useful segment on Suzanne and Mandy's show. Um, you know, w what we need to bring back is Skip Hampton. <laughs> okay. No. Maybe, but <laughs> Tim, I really somewhat agree with you and then highly disagree with you. So I do agree that hearing that everything's great all the time, not useful at all. I, it doesn't, doesn't help me. Everyone does it about a few things. Like Sam Healy, you know, I, I, I used to never be able to ask him about a movie because he'd be like, that was a great movie. I was like, ah. Uh, did we just watch the same thing? Mm -hmm. 
Like I would have fired all the actors and burned all the tapes, you know, but <laughs> you know, so he just was that's the way he was about movies. Some people are like about games. You know, it is what it is. Yep. I I think you should whoop up on games when they're bad. I think I think I have the proof that I have done so. <laughs> um especially if you go to the video. See what I do is I tend to pick more games I like on our show than not. Yeah. Um I'm not here usually to trash on games too much because, as I said at the beginning of the episode, I only have room for a few games. Right. So I don't normally do the bad ones here. Go watch my videos. I've done over 600 negative reviews. That being said, I don't want to constantly be beating on someone. I don't want a Grinch who's – you know that guy who doesn't like anything? I, I wonder if you're in the wrong hobby. <laughs> Because Perhaps. definitely I know people like that. I have some friends who I play games with who occasionally I'm like, maybe you should just play the same game you like all the time. Because you dislike that game, you dislike that one, you dislike that one, you dislike that one. I dislike several games for sure. Mm -hmm. But if I disliked even half the games that came across, I think I would be – I would not hobby. enjoy the hobby as much. Yeah. 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 Sure. I mean there's a lot of sixes and sevens for sure. Sure. Out there, then I wish they were better. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah, sometimes it's fun to hear that Grinch guy. I don't want that that often. I'm telling you, you're right. There's a lot of that on Facebook. But I don't know. I feel like, and if you think the Dice Tower Facebook group has the haters, then you have not ventured out into the wider world of Facebook. <laughs> I think the Dice Tower Facebook group is highly moderated and fairly positive. Fairly. I've occasionally stepped in other Facebook groups, and I was like, ah! And that's how I lost a leg. What? That's how toxic it was. I got better. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like I was somewhat critical at the top of the show this time. Yes, when Eric says, I found it interesting, that means it's a raging pit of disgusting filth. Yeah. Have you ever seen the Key and Peele? Obama translator skit, yes. Eric. Yes, the anger. We should do that. We should do that sometimes. <laughs> I'll be the anger translator from Eric. He'll be like, "Yeah, it's okay. It's garbage." We'll get to work on that one. Speaking of that, all positivity. You should actually check out the video channel starting this week. Eric is putting up his top 100 games of all time. Oh my! It's actually happening. It. I'm glad you're surprised by that. Uh, so, you know, I kind of am. <laughs> it's a deep fake. <laughs> I kind of am surprised that it's happening. Yeah, so uh, we're putting them up uh, over the next month. You'll see them go up. So keep an eye on our video channel, and let's find out. I don't even know what they are. I haven't watched them yet, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Like, what will be his number one? I don't know. It's in the theme song. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe we didn't even put the theme song up. Maybe not. I haven't seen that part that's, yet. That's less of a spoiler. I don't know what. I don't think we put them together yet. Ah. All righty. Well, that's Q and A. Let's jump to the top ten. The top ten. It's a dice tower top ten. The dice tower's top ten list is brought to you by the Op, also known as USA Opoly, at theop.games. All right, folks. One hit wonders. Now we did this oh, a really long time ago, I think. Wow. It must have been a really long time ago because I don't remember doing this. Hmm. Well, I know I did it on the video show. Okay. Huh. I thought we did it as on the dice on the dice tower. If we did, it's I, I have totally blocked it out. I'm not ruling out the fact that it may have happened. Yeah, we did I'm... it in episode 379. Wow. Okay, you well, were definitely I, recording the show with me at that point. I was for sure. Uh, I, I'm curious to see what I said back then. Cause... Oh, you, you. Well, you'll be. This is going to be interesting is to it? compare what you said then with what you said now. Now it's always possible that some of the games that we talked about back then have had other designers games True. since then. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is kind of a tricky thing here, folks. So one of the things I immediately disallowed is I didn't pick any designed game from the past year or two. Sure. I think I even went back a few more years than that because you know, I don't call them one-hit wonder because they still may have other hits 
and right. so may all of these designers. In music, it's usually easy to call someone a one-hit wonder. We're usually looking back 30, 40 years. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, it's still fun to talk about this and more of a, man, I hope these people design another game. Although Eric has a few on his list that I don't think they're designing any more games. No? Oh, well, we could hope. I think you may have a couple designers who are deceased. <laughs> I, I think I do, yes. So I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I read the obituaries for at least one of them. Yeah, well, that means it's pretty definitive that they're one-hit wonders. <laughs> no one's going to come along and say, hey, here's this other game. I think I win. All right, well, I'm going to be checking on these now. <laughs> How many of Eric's people are dead? That's a new... <laughs> That's that's actually kind of dark. I don't mean it to be dark. Uh, I'm just saying that that's definitive. Then, so Eric's list is already better than mine, even if we do have crossover. All right, let's get started. Number ten. Number ten for me is Anthony E. Pratt, who designed Deceased. a uh, mystery game called Clue. 1994. Uh, that's when, yeah, when he passed away. Uh, he was the designer of Clue. Uh, it would have been nice to see, you know, there's lots of Clue variants uh, that he has uh, at least a name on. But it would have been nice to see more deduction games from Mr. Pratt. Um, and, and Clue, while a mass market game uh, that, that many of us have played, is sort of the groundwork for a lot of deduction games that we love so much today. So I would have liked to see more from the designer of Clue, Mr. Pratt, number 10. Yeah, I guess I should have put in here a caveat. I'm only picking games I like. So <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not. I'm not actually. I'm. 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 I'm seriously not trying to detract from Eric's list. In fact, this will be the first time I'll say nothing negative about Eric's list at all. All right. Well, I mean, I well, wasn't. Almost. I wasn't picking stuff almost. that I didn't like. I, all the games on here I do enjoy, but there. I was. I was going more on the designer and the um, and sort of the significance of the design, and not necessarily. But we'll get to it. Well, I can't even talk about my number 10 because Eric has deduced it far earlier than me. Mm, I told you deduction games are good. Number nine. Number nine is designer Adam Gertzbein. He designed a game called Wasabi, which was about laying tiles of ingredients to form sushi. Had really nice production from Z-Man Games, one of the uh, earlier Z-Man uh, productions. And I, I thought it was fun. It was uh, a, a silly uh, recipes that you were creating and interesting ideas and production and all of that. And I would have liked to see more from Adam Gertzbein. Wasabi, number nine. Huh, that's interesting. I did not realize that. That's one of those games that if it came out today, I don't know that it would make as big of a splash, right? There's a lot of games about sushi and wasabi. and Yeah. And, but when it came out, we were like, this is something different. It was really cool. It had the cool, uh, you know, uh, laminate bowls with the wasabi cubes that you, you put in for extra actions. It was really well produced. Yeah, yeah. I have fond memories of that game. My number nine is... Toby Ho, Deception, Murder in Hong Kong, or as he originally called it, CS Files. It's pretty much the only thing he's designed. He's, you know, a lot of uh, expansions and things for it. This is a great party game. It's really well done. It came out, well, it's been several years now since it's, it's come out. I want to say it came out five years ago, maybe. Uh, and it's still one of my favorite party games. I like the idea of trying to figure out who the murderer is. It's just a lot of fun. So that's Toby Ho, Deception, Murder in Hong Kong. Hmm, good choice. Thanks, Eric. Number eight. Number eight is designer Alfred Mosher Butts, who designed a word game called Scrabble. Uh, I really wanted to, to mention this one because uh, Alfred knew so much that this was his one hit that when he did design another game, I was going to say this. All right, go ahead. It wasn't nearly as successful. Uh, his second design was called Alfred's Other Game. <laughs> Which yes. I don't think anyone – has anybody else done something like that? Maybe Freedom and Freeze or <laughs> – Alan Moon has done something like that, that like the designer that it's just making a reference to the fact that this is another game from this person. Um, but Scrabble or Alfred's other game was like a solitaire word game, multiplayer solitaire thing. I Scrabble, really want to get a copy of this other one now. <laughs> not many people own it. Um, no, anyway, Scrabble 
has legs and continues to be played today. And it would have been nice to、uh, to maybe have another one that was as successful as Scrabble. Number eight, 1993. By the way, was when he、yeah. passed away.、So、that's two. You're two for three. I I really want to get Alfred out of the game though. This is this has always amused me. That this exists. It looks <laughs> the cover of it looks like a Mastermind game. It does look like Mastermind. I thought because he's sitting there with a a、uh, a gorgeous woman sitting on his chair next to him, and he's looking at you like, "That's right, I will beat you at this game." It looks a little scrabbleishy, but there's only nine ratings on Board Game Geek. So weird. It, it's probably a reference. If if the the title reference is to Scrabble, maybe the cover reference is to Mastermind. It's almost like a joke game. Well, I'm looking it up on eBay. <gasps> I can get a copy for seven bucks plus fifteen shipping. What? <laughs> What? It's going in the Dice Tower Library. Why is shipping so expensive? All right, my number eight is Santorini. I know technically, like right now, they're releasing Santorini, New York, which、okay. is a A very weird name for a game. <laughs> That is a little weird. I'm also going to call a game USA Morocco. <laughs> Anyhow, no, I know why they do that. Carcassonne has been doing it for a long time, right?、Um, but Santorini is a great abstract strategy game. I love it, and so I'm looking very much forward to seeing. I think we may see more from him in the future. It's been a few years now since Santorini came out, so. Yeah. I think great game. So come on, Gord. I'm sorry, it's Gord with an exclamation point after. Gord number seven. Number seven is Takashi Ishida, who designed a little silly racing game called Magical Athlete.、Um, I like it. I like it. Yeah, and and, and you know the, the gem of Magical Athlete being a really dumb roll and move racing game is the interaction between all these different characters, and that sort of interaction and creativity. Is is very important in coming up with new crazy designs, and I think、uh, Takashi Ishida would、uh, would produce something else equally zany and wacky and and variable if、uh, if they were given another another whirl. So that's my number seven, Magical Athlete from Takashi Ishida. As an aside here, this is really annoying. Board Game Geek is not working, so I can't pull up stats on all these people. Oh no! <sighs> I did、right. I did check that one.、Uh, Well, I know. I just wanted to.、Else. I wanted to drop in some nuggets of knowledge I seemingly have in the back of my head. All right. Anyway, my number seven is higher in Eric's list because he bet on black, as I should. Number six. Number six.、Uh, the designer was a very famous French、uh, filmmaker not, called Albert Lamoris.、Uh, we've actually mentioned Albert's work already. Risk. Was his single hit?、Uh, of course, he gets credit for a bunch of other Risk variants, but Risk was it.、Um, and it, it would have been nice to to see what else came out no. there. And and Risk is, it, as we see in the Legacy version, still has legs. Number six, Risk. Nineteen seventies when he passed away.、Hmm. He invented. He he was born in night in nineteen twenty two, so he actually died fairly young. Um. Uh, but he designed Risk in 1957. It's been around for quite a bit,、mm-hmm. I think. Anyhow,、um, good choice. When I dream from Chris D- Darcel Darsaklis.、Okay. When I dream is another great party game,、uh, as players all are trying to give clues about a card to someone whose eyes are closed or covered, and you're trying to guess the card from the clues. Except some players are lying to you. And so it's a lot of fun. Great, great party game. I love to see more. I think designing a simple party game is quite difficult. So I look forward to see what else he might do. Yeah, another good choice. Number five. My number five is the Manhattan Project, designed by Brandon Tibbets.、Uh, Tibbets also designed the Manhattan Project too, but I'm I'm going to count that as not.、Uh, it's a different game, but it's it's. Pretty much the same thing. The big no, hit. It's not. It's not worth your time. It's okay.、Uh, I'm, I'm not counting the variants of their big hit as being different things. Also, sometimes these people have a few smaller games, like Gord, who did Santorini, did like a Twelve Days of Christmas little card game. That if it's not a hit, then he's still a one-hit wonder. Right. 
Uh, the Manhattan Project is is a great worker placement game, very thematic, uh, and and works very well. And and would love to see something uh, that's equally thematic in another universe, a different setting. From Brandon Tibbetts. Number five, the Manhattan Project. My number five is what? It's Merchants of Venus, which will show up what? higher on Eric's list. That's not a one-hit wonder. I know it's not. Number four. My number four was Tom's number 10, and that is Bruce Allen's design, Tobago, uh, which is actually getting an expansion very soon, um, which is interesting. It's a deduction game or induction game where you sort of gradually figure out the location of a treasure piece and then get your jeeps to go there and the cards that you play are going to limit the possible locations for that treasure it's a cool system nice components and uh this new like volcano expansion sounds really interesting but i'd like to see something new and different from bruce allen designer of tobago number four yeah, this is an interesting one. This was my number 10. And it's weird. The game came out in 2009, and the first expansion is coming out 11 years later. Wow. So weird. But I want it. <sighs> the good news about this expansion, folks, is I believe this means you will be able to find Tobago more easily now. We've been talking about this one for a while. I was under the assumption it was out of print. Yeah. So, huzzah! Yeah. Well, it should certainly make the original. There's probably a, a new printing of the original coming, too. Well, yeah, that's what I meant. But, I mean, it's being reprinted. and so. Right. All right. My number four is Charlie Catino, who designed Nexus Ops. Yes, he designed the Xena Warrior Princess CCG, but let's not get caught up in that. <laughs> He's done one board game, and that's Nexus Ops. And it is a fantastic one. The thing is, it's been a while. 2005, 15 years. But this is such a good game. I was just looking at this game two days ago because I 3D printed the monolith for the middle of it and Holly painted it up so it looks cool and everything. I'm just excited about trying this one out again. Uh, I think it's held its weight pretty well. No one makes little light war games these days. This one was fun. Come on, Charlie. Number three. Number three was Tom's number five. Not Merchant of Venus, but Zaya, Legends of a Drift System. It's a, a space game, uh, lots of ways to earn points, but it includes a pickup and deliver, but also exploration and attacking other players and building your ship in cool custom designs. A really neat game. Um, and Cody Miller, the designer, uh, I think has other things in the works, but nothing has hit uh, quite like Zaya. And, and its expansions. So I'd love to see something equally as pretty as Zaya, my number three. Oh, I see why I got to confuse with Merchants of Venus, because it replaces it. <laughs> and that's why it's on my list. Not true. Cody, Cody, Miller, <laughs> Cody Miller has made a game about surfing, but you never heard of it, have you? That's right, because Zaya is his one-hit wonder currently. Mm. Okay, so i like to make something clear. First of all, I made this list actually a month ago. I was prepared. Okay. So my number three is Mechs vs. Minions from the Riot team. All right. At the time of me making this list, that was the only game they had made. All right. Uh, since then, they've published Tellstones. So I okay. like to revise this by saying I'm still waiting for another good game <laughs> from the Riot team. After Mechs vs. Minions. And that's, uh, I don't want to get back caught up in that at all again. Um, but yeah, Mechs vs. Minions, great game. They are certainly trying new things. Tailstones, they tried something new. Hopefully they go back to, it doesn't have to be big and grandiose like Mechs vs. Minions, but I would love to see what they do next. I think they're fantastic designers. They're great people all around. Um, Tailstones was an experiment. It has obviously worked for many people, did not work for me. So I'm going to still say they're a one hit wonder for now. The Riot Team, Mechs vs. Minions. But they, they also, um, you know, dabble in video games, right? Well, sure, but I don't know if that board game design team did the video game or if they just work on part of it somehow, somewhere. You know what I mean? Riot's a gigantic yeah, right. company. I wouldn't say everyone sure. who works there is a designer of the video game. So you're saying that this was the like accounting department that did the board no, game? No, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe they are the designers of the board game. Don't try to pin me into a corner. No one puts okay. Tommy in a corner. 
<laughs> Mechs versus Minions is a great game. Uh, I I just didn't I didn't really consider them as a one hit wonder uh, with like a monolith video game behind them as well. No, so, come on now. Doesn't your wealth of the company should not all right. should not boo boo to it, you. I mean, you know what your I classes. meant to say? It was my number eleven. <laughs> Number two. Number two. Uh, well, I guess Tom's going to take it in just a little bit. Uh, but really, this designer has two hits. One is the game we're going to talk about, and the second is is the card with their dog on it. My number two is the most obvious choice for this. I only put my other game as number one because I like it more, I think. But mm. now number two is Targi, which I'm sensing Eric just hasn't played yet. Nope. Eric, seriously, this is a great two-player game. How many times have I told you this on this podcast? Um, well, you told me a couple weeks ago. Did I really? It was only then? Yeah. All right. Well, this is amazing, this two-player game. Andreas Steiger, uh, he just made an expansion this year. That's great, but just like Bruce Allen, who made an expansion for Tobaga, where's the next game? By the way, folks, I would like to have an aside here. If you only make one great game in your life, I really do feel like that's amazing. Yeah, I don't feel like you have sure. to keep making great games all the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, this list is more tongue-in-cheek than anything else. I think having one game that we talk about, my word, that's fantastic. So, yeah, yeah. So rest on your laurels, Andreas. I want another game. But, but what Tom was really saying is if you're going to make one great game, make it Targi. <laughs> yeah. And finally, number one. My number one it was the one that I thought of immediately when we were talking about this list, and that is Henry Stern's design, Vegas Showdown, uh, a game about running a casino uh, that had uh, some cool auction mechanisms and tile laying and was a big surprise from the, uh, the, the resurrected Avalon Hill uh, as one that, that people really, really enjoyed uh, from that particular uh, phase of the company. But then we haven't seen anything else from Mr. Stern, and it would be kind of cool to see more. Vegas Showdown, my number one, and Tom's number seven. It's interesting. That's the second game I have on my list there from Avalon Hill, that team. You know, I already had Mex first. I mean, not, I'm sorry, Nexus, Nexus Ops. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the I don't know where Avalon Hill found these people, but that's pretty neat. Yeah, Vegas Showdown, such a great game. Love to see more Henry. Mm-hmm. And my number one was Eric's number two. And that's Jacob Frixilius the, from the Frixilius family. Um, Terraforming Mars. Now, yes, they've designed one or two other games, but only one is a hit for sure, and that's Terraforming Mars. A very big hit. Helped Stronghold become a, a name for mm-hmm. sure. It's certainly one of the most popular games to come out in the last decade, and it's one I still love playing. Agreed. Uh, it, it is a very solid game, and, and it just sort of dwarfs anything else that Jacob uh, has done or, or has coming out. But I think another like large box game, maybe another couple years from now, I, I feel like the, the Terraforming Mars expansions might be dying off. Uh, and so the next big thing I'm sure will be on the horizon soon from Mr. Frixelius. All right, let's see what the people have chosen. Number 20, Vegas Showdown. Wow, your, 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 your one was there, 20. But it's on there. <laughs> that is true. Number 19 is Aeon's End. That's Kevin Riley, and he's done quite a few Aeon's End games, but that's about it. Number 18 is Hive. That's John Yanni. Hmm. He's done a few other games. Tatsu, Army of Frogs. Tatsu was 3,926. That's pretty high, but I guess Hive is his biggest hit. Uh, Then 17, Tobago. 16, When I Dream. 15, Bloku. I considered Blockus. Or Blockus or Blocus. You know, they this company needs to tell us how to pronounce the game. Mm-hmm. That's from Bernard Taviatin, a French game designer, mathematician, and artist. And pretty much, he's done a few abstracts, but he's mostly just done Blocus stuff. Number 14 from the people, Twilight Struggle. Now, they, I, I, this was on my list originally, but I changed it because... Um, the they just came out with Imperial Struggle. And mm. Jason Matthews has gone on to do many other games, including 1960 and stuff. Right. I think it's the other, the co-designer. Adopta. 
Gupta, uh, Ananta Gupta. Yeah, but he again, he just did Imperial Struggle, which is yep. getting some positive buzz. So I don't know. Um, then we have Hanamani Kochi Yononi. Hanami Koji, yep. Fine. Well, that's from Kota Nakayama. And he did that. He's done that game, but he's also done that Tokyo Jido Han Baiki game. You know that box that has all those games inside it? Hmm. I don't. Oh, yeah, you've seen it. Uh, Jordan Draper games. The, oh, okay. It, it, it makes, it like has the vending machine in it. There's all those little games. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so there's that. But I get it wasn't as big of a hit. It did well on Kickstarter, though. And then Onitama. All right. That was number 12 for everybody. I think I can agree that Onitama is a big hit. Yeah, maybe I should have put that on my list. I, I probably, that one, for whatever reason, didn't show up on my radar. But I, yeah, yeah I, might have, I might have put that on there. There were a couple, I will admit, on your list, Tom, that I didn't consider. That I had to rejigger my list when I saw yours. Oh, sure. No worries. Number 11, Dixit. Number 10, Gloomhaven. Mm. That's a tough one. Isaac has had two somewhat successful games. I mean, I'm, you might argue Frosthaven is going to be successful. But then again, Frosthaven is just Gloomhaven again. Right. It's a little too new for me. I think Isaac has a bright future. Nine is Clans of Caledonia. Uh, yeah, that's true. He did make another game, uh, the designer of this, that I like a lot, but no one no one has ever seemingly heard of it. What's it called? Let me look it up. Um, Clans of Caledonia is actually number 42 on Board Game Geek. So it's Juma Al Juju, I think is how you say his last name. Green Deal. I like Green Deal, but it did not hmm. get a lot of love. Um, Everdell, number eight. Oh, it's yeah. still a little too new for me. Seven, Santorini. Six, Terraforming Mars. Five, Zaya. Four, Mechs vs. Minions. Three, Spirit Island. Spirit Island may have been on the very cusp of being too new for me. It's 2017. That's by R. Eric Roos. He did Fealty, though. Fealty's ranked pretty high. I like Fealty. I haven't played Spirit Island, so... Ah, two is Targi, and number one, Deception, Murder in Hong Kong. Lots oh, wow. of crossovers there. There's really not a lot of, quote-unquote, one-hit wonders in the industry. So sure. there you have it. All right. Well, what? That was interesting. If you can think of something we didn't talk about, mention it in the Facebook group for the Dice Tower or on our Board Game Geek Guild. Lots of places to talk about board games with people. Indeed. Thank you, Eric, for coming on the show. We're glad to talk to everyone about games. Well, Eric makes the show work. He <laughs> always says such kind things to me, and it's so very nice. You got so, it, boss. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode, number 681, was recorded on October 22nd, 2020. Mandy and Suzanne join you next week, and in two weeks, Tom, Mandy, and I uproariously understand our top ten games that start with the letter U. Support for this podcast comes from listeners like you. Thank you for spreading the word. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. Find out more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackvassal.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric. Production assistance from Roy Canada, Mike Delisio, and Rob Seary. Our theme was composed by Timothy Pinkham. Mr. Pullman, Marlowe, K. Dick, and Seymour Hoffman's ocean-going vessels brought to you by Philip Ships. And you can get the latest on everything Dice Tower at Dicetower.com. We love feedback. Visit the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com. Email us at Tom at Dicetower.com or Eric at Dicetower.com. Or follow us on Facebook. And of course, you can find more from the Dice Tower Network, including all the bits, men on board, cardboard and wine, sporadically board, board game design lab, tabletop game talk, the family gamers, the portal gaming podcast, this game is broken, and board game breakfast at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. I think you just like it because when you you know when you knock me down, I I get up again. Never gonna keep me down. Now it's in your head. Thank you very much. Just wanted to...
leave that with you.